And I, I guess we don't have to go around this virtual room because all your names are on the screen, so we now know who you all are. And I think everybody pretty much knows everybody. This is Steve. Uh, he's going to be Tuesday, Thursday, helping with IT here at the Ocala site. Adam is going off to uh, to Florida, um, particularly on Tuesday, Thursday. That's where it will be. So, all right. Um, the very first part of this is going to be somewhat um, basic, high level. By the way, what, where's that sound? Does I don't know? know where that's coming from. Um, ooh, it stopped. No, it didn't. Okay, well, anyway, uh, the very first part of this will be somewhat basic. Um, it will get more and more detailed as we go along, but I think I just want to start at the beginning. Oh, is Malenko going to be here? I don't know. Okay. Is that is, him? Hey, Malenko, I just asked if you were going to be here. Yeah. Have it, you can see. Okay. Do you want to All right. Um, so I think it's good, though, because a lot of us have started to talk a lot about events and what are events. And actually, um, by the time I get to that definition, it would have to be much later. I think I need to start at the beginning and talk about what language processing is and um, sort of the different aspects of that and the issues that we have with trying to figure out what an event is of any part of speech, um, you know, what argument structure is and those sorts of things. And I'll eventually get into uh, some uh, lexical acquisition work that I did a while back. And this really relates to things that are already going on at IHMC. Um, I'll eventually, today I'm going to talk a little bit about interlingual representations, and York has worked on that, as have other people, um, CMU, Jaime Carbonell, um, Kevin Knight uh, at, at USC. Lots of people have worked on interlingual um, representations. Also in the second tutorial, there's some work that's uh, where I touch on the use of LDOCE, Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, to build resources to do large-scale language processing. And York is one of the original um, researchers using LDOCE um, quite some time ago. We were both simultaneously doing different types of work, but using that same resource. So there's a lot of overlap with, uh, and then James uh, with uh, deep language understanding and um, his work on uh, deep representations and inference, all of that um, comes into uh, comes into play um, with some of the things we'll be talking about. So the first part will be kind of fast because a lot of you know all this stuff. But um, you know, when we think about natural language processing, where where does that fit into uh, the taxonomy and of computer science more generally? And there are a lot of different diagrams that have been drawn over the years. You can't see the bottom of the slide. That's too bad. Um, almost because <coughs> uh, there would, could be some things that will. Okay. If you, if you can't see the bottom of the slide, you may be able to adjust some things at the bottom. Can you guys see adapted from Radha Mahalshya at the bottom of this slide? You can't see the words adapted. Okay. Yeah, it's cut off. Yeah, it's like halfway through. You can see it now. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll have to read to you the words at the bottom of each slide. Um, so this is uh, just a particular drawing that I picked from Rada, um, who's who was in Texas and now has moved up to University of Michigan just a couple of months ago. Um, really great researcher. But we could have drawn this a whole bunch of different ways. In any case, most people think of language processing as falling, falling under the heading of artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence, of course, has a whole bunch of areas, very simplified here, robotics, machine learning, logic, language search, and other areas, of course. Um, we're, we know that at IHMC because there's so much research going on. Um, and then with language processing, uh, by the way, we can change the temperature anytime people are feeling warm, feel, feel free. Um, language processing touches on areas of information retrieval, machine translation, and other types of language analysis and language generation. Um, and a large part of what we'll talk about for this and the next lecture is semantics and syntax or parsing. That is. Um, the difference between them, 
you know, how do we sit at the interface of semantics and syntax and what does it buy us if we do that? Um, once we have that, can we build resources and then what, what sort of processing can we do um, after that? So just taking a quick tour down uh, memory lane, some of you may know that in the 40s and 50s there were really two fundamental paradigms that developed um, formal language theory. Um, you hear names like Chomsky, Kleene, Bacchus, um, and they were interested in the formal characterization of grammar, uh, in particular looking at context-free grammar, regular grammars, and then associating those grammars with the relevant machinery or automata. So there are different powers of automata based on the type of language you're, you're trying to recognize. But simultaneously, uh, what was going on was probability theory was, was starting to um, be a big deal. So um, the problem of language understanding was examined from the point of view of decoding through a noisy channel. So people like Shannon did work on this using information theoretic concepts, um, the notion of entropy to measure uh, the success of language models. Um, now, because of those parallel tracks, you'll see even today there's sort of always seems to be these two paths, but what happened was there was an early divergence that eventually uh, was brought back together in some of the hybrid models we see today. But between 57 and 1983, um, there really was still this division between the two. Um, and so on the symbolic side, where people looked at formal grammar as the basis of language, um, logic and logic-based programming for characterizes, characterizing syntax or semantics, um, looking at inference from this point of view, and I've listed some, some of the relevant people. Um, natural language understanding and generation systems built in the symbolic paradigm. Uh, discourse processing, looking at the role of intention and focus, um, some famous uh, names listed there. Um, at the same time, stochastic modeling, um, there were many different probabilistic methods developed for early processes related to or in language, such as speech recognition or optical character recognition. And especially at IBM, people were examining this in great detail. So um, now, what happened uh, for the next decade was um, the rise of probabilistic models in speech and language processing. Um, and here, uh, people began to say, hey, uh, some of the speech and language processing you're doing over there on the symbolic side, we can apply some of the techniques um, from the stochastic side to that as well. We can do part of speech tagging and parsing and word sets disambiguation. So you started to see a lot of papers in these areas where people were t uh, testing out their uh, probabilistic frameworks and comparing stochastic and sim symbolic methods um, and building even more powerful models for language understanding and learning tasks. Um, so that was pretty cool. After that, um, there were such advances in software and hardware. I mean, it just kind of took off from there where um, the creation of NLP needs, natural language processing needs, were everywhere, especially um, with the uh, advent of the web. We had a lot of need for enhanced information retrieval. Machine translation uh, was big all along, but became even bigger at this point. Um, spelling and grammar checking, speech recognition, and, and synthesis. Um, and so what happened was this stochastic and symbolic methods started to be combined for real-world applications. And at the end of today's lecture, you'll see an example where we were looking at it for, for machine translation, a hybrid approach that Nizar Halash and I worked on about a decade ago where um, this was, it, actually you'll see some familiar things in there if you worked in the events team because um, that was where we developed CAPBAR. So you'll see the motivation for that. Okay, so then what happened, actually I think in your handout it says 2000 to 2007, but I've updated this slide slightly. So really machine learning is huge. Um, we have large amounts of data, it's now widely available. The Linguistic Data Consortium is now 
20 years old. I went to their 20th anniversary in September of last year. They uh, in in uh, Philadelphia, and they are the sort of among the main movers and shakers, probably the main mover and shaker of data that is uh, collecting data, um, either grabbing it because it already exists and now we need to use it, or if that's too hard because of privacy issues, collecting it with permission from people over cell phones or whatever means they need to do it, and then annotating the data and then helping people at, for example, NIST, to run evaluations using a test set and an evaluation set where um, they've annotated the ground truth and now they're evaluating our systems against that. So um, this is huge. Um, there's an increased focus on learning uh, in the last decade and a half. Um, it's led to a more serious interplay with the statistical machine learning community. So there was a huge chasm before where this is now the communities are really being brought together. You can see this in the nature of the papers that are being presented at ACL. Um, so people are looking at unsupervised learning techniques as well, not just, hey, let's learn from annotated texts. Um, but because it's difficult to produce reliably annotated corpora, people are much more interested in, well, what can we do if we just have corpora? Is there a way just by, um, or you know, even with a small amount, semi-supervised, a small amount of seed information, can we learn something from the corpora? Um, big data and data science are now front and center. NIST is starting a new initiative. Actually, this is, um, I'm starting an IPA just one third time in about a month. And uh, one, one of my tasks will be to build some new evaluations in the area of data science and big data um, these, there, this involves several different scientific communities, so it's not supposed to be incestuous where I lead the whole language. You know, language is sort of somewhere else. There may be a task in there on language, but we are talking with the biologists. We're talking, you know, sensor data. You know, there's just so much data out there, um, and everybody has their own way of trying to figure out how to get through that data. So this is, um, this is big, and language processing may or may not be included under that. Okay. Um, so, question. You have all this data, you're out there, you're trying to navigate the web, but really what you have when you sit down to navigate through the web is... Hi there, Lucian. <laughs> okay, I think he muted. Um, so uh, when you get on the web and you're trying to navigate through, what are you trying to do? You're really trying to answer a question. And um, if you want to, and so Google actually does quite well with keyword search, but sometimes you need to get more intricately involved in that question, that it's not just, hey, tell me um, all the people who talk, it, tell me all the things you can about a particular actor or a politician, but tell me what their opinion is about this particular um, event, um, you know, also, what people said about their opinion about that event, it can get very nested. That Those kinds of queries get very intricate, and you can't just do it with very simple um, keyword search. And so um, analysis of the language, you know, doing it as a natural language query um, seems like something that people often need. Um, and so people have started to work on this um, and building systems that decompose the signal, whether it's spoken or written, into meaningful units. So what does that involve? Well, if it's speech um, or, or text, you have to recognize the characters. Um, where does one word begin and, and where, where does one word end and another one begin? Um, and so we have this thing called tokenization that we talk about in English. We, where we want to, it's really easy because we look for a white space. That's how we decide what a word is in English. And there are a few exceptions, like you have the apostrophe S exception, where really you want to break that into two tokens. One is the core piece or the root, and the other is the apostrophe S, especially if it's, you know, the word is, and that's what you're trying to split off. But even for the possessive, you want to do this. 
So, you know, very few exceptions. In Spanish, there are also very few exceptions, but you have del, which is de el, it's two words, and you want to break it up into two words. So that's the process of tokenization, except that when there's no white space involved, you start to call it segmentation, but they're really kind of the same thing. Um, it's just for some reason we call it tokenization in a language like English and in a language like Chinese, where there is no white space dividing those words up, and often a word consists of one character or two, that's most, those are the two most common, sometimes three. Um, and so now you, you, you've got all this ambiguity in trying to segment your space and no white space to help you out. So it gets very difficult in a language like Chinese. But the idea is you're trying to figure out the letters, the words, the phones. Phones are what make up phonemes, which is part of the um, phonetic pronunciation. Um, so you may, in speech, need to have knowledge of phonological patterns. As you go along, there's ambiguity in, in recognizing that what I can write here, right? Um, they won't be able to see it, maybe, but I'll call it out if I have to. Uh, so just that very first part there, I am enormously proud. I mean to make you proud. The very first piece, it, those are phonologically equivalent, but we're going off on a completely different path for each of those. So I mean enormously proud. I mean to make you proud. Um, it gets even worse when you have something like, um, uh, this guy is falling. where you've got phonologically equivalent units, and it's a global ambiguity all the way to the end of the sentence. Um, with the examples that I've given here, with the enormously proud case, it's not globally ambiguous, it's just a local ambiguity that may be resolved by the time you get to the end of the sentence. Whereas here, if somebody says, this guy is falling, this guy is falling, yeah, um, and fluent in sort of native uh, English, there's no distinction, or even, you know, I'm, I'm riding, I'm, you know, like I'm riding a bike versus I'm writing a letter. Those are uh, phonologically equivalent patterns. So being able to pull those apart and figure out uh, what's a word and what's not is part of um, dealing with uh, speech uh, and some text issues, like, for example, in Chinese, where you've, you, you have to have the same sort of parsing going along because there's no white space. All right, so morphological analysis. Um, so words are made up of roots, or what we are calling lemma. You'll, you'll hear uh, roots, lemmas, base form, stem, um, all these different terms in morphology. They all mean the same thing. And what you do is you add affixes. Um, typically, we put suffixes on the things in English, and that's mostly what we care about. But you should also think about prefixes. So we just say affixes, because in a language like German or many different languages, it's much more complex. It's not just mostly suffixes. So, um, and here, your the analysis is about figuring out what the root form is. Um, for example, in inflectional morphology, where you have singular and plural nouns, or in uh, or you have verbs, third person singular. We're very impoverished. We really don't add much to our verbs uh, in English. In other languages, you know, like in Spanish, you have 42 inflectional forms for every verb. You know, you don't have that uh, in English. So it's it's an easy case to show. But basically, morphological analysis refers to finding what that stem is and then what the affix around it, usually a suffix in English. And it could, so when you say ducks, are you talking about the plural noun, like the animal that's walking around, a bunch of them? Or are you talking about, you know, somebody who ducks regularly to avoid, you know, being hit by something? All right, that's what the second one is. Does everybody know what duck is in that, you know, the verb, you know, I ducked. So, or she ducks from being hit. Um, it's actually, I gave, I, I gave that example to a very broad audience once, and duck is not the most common verb, actually, for you know, so people don't always know what that is. All right, so uh, there are two types of morphology. Inflectional is the one I just talked about, and um, sort of the way I distinguish them is through this first one, the ducks case. The part of speech stays the same, so ducks um, is 
you're, you're going from a noun to a noun or a verb to a verb. Whereas here, when you add N-E-S-S to the end of kind, you're going from an adjective to a noun. So derivational morphology typically changes the part of speech. There are two different types of it. You have to account for both of them when you're doing language analysis. Um, and then, of course, when you do either of those, inflectional or derivational, you have to worry about spelling changes. And, um, you know, each language does things differently. And I only put inflectional cases here, but, of course, you could have fox plus s is foxes, right? So that's, um, oh, that's also inflectional. Hmm. I'll have to think of a derivational case. But sometimes the spelling changes when you do a derivational case. All right, so what's next on the docket? Well, um, let's say you're really good at all this stuff, phonetics and, and figuring out the words, their morphology. Now you want to associate structure with the full sentence. Um, and we're sort of looking at things a sentence at a time here, but really what you want to do is kind of look at a document at a time. But for now, I'm isolating a sentence at a time. And for this um, why do you want to put structure on the string? Well, you want to think about what it means, and you're not quite ready yet. First, you're going to figure out, well, what relation do all these words have to each other at some sort of shallow level? But ultimately, what you're doing is preparing for semantic interpretation. So this sentence where, you know, I'm from Maryland, so they have terrapins, but anyway, I guess I should change this to gator, or I don't know. Then it would cause a controversy. My daughter went to MSU, by the way, but uh, my husband went to UF. So anyway, um, so I watched the Terrapin um, syntactic structure is essentially taking the sentence and bracketing, bracketing it into its noun, noun phrase and verb phrase pieces. It's predicate argument structure. Um, we talk about this also in terms of dependency structure. There are two different ways to parse. One is sort of more part of speech based and the you know what are the parts of speech and how do you break it into its phrasal units the other is more semantic or logical um, where we think of the main predicate in this sentence as watch and what are you watching and who's the watcher well i am the one who's doing the watching and the thing that i'm watching is the terrapin so a uh, dependency tree structure is another way to to do a syntactic analysis on the path toward doing a semantic analysis. So, um, so then moving to semantics, here um, what we're doing is we're trying to represent the meaning behind whatever that syntactic structure is. And it really is supposed to extract away from the syntactic structure. Um, so, and that's really important. So for the previous example where we had that hierarchical structure, um, we, we would abstract away into, say, a first-order logic, you know, watch, I, terrapin, um, you know, and, and in fact, we're abstracted enough away from it that that would be the same representation for I watched the terrapin or the terrapin was watched by me. So the active and the passive forms, it doesn't matter, the underlying logic is the same, right? So that, that's the idea of that. Um, but of course, language can get very complex, such as who did I watch? Um, you know, what you're, what you're trying to do is, um, or what did I watch? What you're trying to do is, no matter, so there might be one way of asking this question, but no matter how you saw it in the input, you still want to be able to answer the terrapin. All right, so um, figuring out that logical structure is going to be very important for this. Question? Yeah. So... I don't understand why the syntactic analysis has to come before the semantic. It doesn't. No, no sentence exists in isolation of meaning in any natural document, right? And you said, well, you really want to look at the document as a whole. So you, as you read, you're bringing expectations about what will flow, what facts you might find out. And these, uh, this is really a semantic interpretation brought to help you do the syntactical analysis. I mean, to you yeah. tell. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't even bother with certain interpretations if you have the framing ahead of time. You wouldn't have to see the ambiguity. Right. No, it's in fact I'm going to show a pipeline picture in a couple of slides, and then I'll just you'll see that I have this comment. Mm -hmm. and and you may have seen it on one of your slides, but this we know it doesn't really work most effectively this way. That is, 
you can't just feed forward from syntax into semantics. And Seems like this would only be useful for fragments, and that you it would have so much more power well, using the semantics first. People have gotten a lot of bang for the buck by doing it sentence by sentence. However, when you start to look at co-reference, like, you know, I watched it, you know, what does it refer to? It's five sentences ago. Then people have moved into other models. And so co-reference has become a big problem in the community. And there are a lot of different co-reference systems that do it like all documents at the same time. You know, they do cross-document co-reference, not just within a document. So it's absolutely the case that you can't just pipeline and go from one thing to that. I'm simplifying very much. And what this. assumptions do you make about use of proper grammar? Well, so early papers said, sorry, but we can only take grammatical input. Now, more recently, people have said, hey, the world's really noisy, and um, that's a lot of where the symbolic and statistical pieces meet, because you can get hints from the linguistic structure, but there should be something that you can learn statistically about the co-occurrence of words that isn't a part of linguistic structure. So... Uh, more, more recently, people are working on very informal, like Twitter or whatever it is, you know, things where it's just one answer, and then the spelling's not even an English word, you know, um, they're working on even very much harder genres, and the assumption there is that anything goes, so it's been all the way from, no, everything has to be really grammatical mm, out okay. to now we can <clears throat> deal with much more informal, and that, that's still a big problem, though, it's like bleeding edge research, so um, there's a lot that can be done there. Do you want to use the mouse pointer when you're pointing to the screen? Like, oh, yeah. But I'll do it's it with on. my mouse. Oh, that's right. On the mouse. <laughs> I'll just try mine and see what works. <laughs> All right. But good point. I should point with this. Except there's an extra mouse oh, there. Yeah. I didn't get that. All right. Uh, what is that extra mouse? There we go. Okay. Very good. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, and then moving to lexical semantics, um, which is another piece of the puzzle where it's really um, serving the purpose of providing the semantics. That is, you can say the terrapin is who I watched, and watch the terrapin is what I do best. And, but you wouldn't say terrapin is what I watched the. By the way, star, the asterisk there means it's either syntactic, well, it typically means it's syntactically ill-formed. And if there's a question mark in front of it, it means it might be syntactically well formed, but it's semantically garbage. All right, so you'll see people using those two things. Um, any case, um, breaking it down into the predicate, the watcher and the watchee are part of what lexical semantics does, and that feeds into building a semantic representation. Um, and then compositional semantics is association of parts of what I just showed you, like that terrapin example, with what are called semantic roles. And I showed you watcher and watchee. Those are actually semantic roles associated with the watching event. Um, and so that's that's what this is here. I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, oh, yeah, one more part of compositional semantics, or semantics more generally, is scoping. And we went over this in some meeting recently. Every man loves a woman. And it's still up on the uh, whiteboard, actually, uh, where you know we're talking about quantifiers swapping places where the for all and the exists, if you swap it, you've got a different meaning. You know, either there's one particular woman that everybody loves, or each individual uh, man loves a, uh, a woman, and who knows, maybe some of those are mapped to each other, but they don't necessarily have to be. Um, so that's uh, the scoping problem, which is a part of compositional semantics. All right, um, there's also the notion of word-governed semantics. So we keep talking at the sentence level, but let's just go down to the word for a second. Is there something we could do with morphology to learn semantics? So, you know, that any verb can add able to form an adjective. It's actually not quite true, so you'll probably think of many. Um, but you could say, I taught the class, the class is teachable. I rejected the idea, the idea is rejectable. So there's something very regular going on here. And that's kind of cool. When you have regularity like that, you can um, build seed linguistic roles and maybe then run machine learning to, to see what you get out of it. Um, and, you know, and maybe some things don't have the able form. It's actually hard to, when you have negative examples, it's hard to know how to work that into the equation with machine learning. 
Um, also, the association of particular words with semantic forms, uh, knowing that John is masculine, that the boys are both masculine, plural, and human. Um, this is another piece of the sort of lexical puzzle that when you have entities, knowing some of the features of them, the semantics surrounding them um, helps you. All right, and then pragmatics. Um, this is about real world knowledge, speaker intention, goal, the goal of the utterance. This is the kind of thing IHMC is big on, right? So the companion style work that's going on, um, any sort of communication between two people, or even just a couple of sentences next to each other where you want to know what the reference of some, what the antecedent is for some reference um, is, that's the kind of thing where you're applying um, some sort of knowledge um, about how to process it. So, and it's actually related to sociology and a whole host of other fields. So when you say, could you turn in your assignment now? It's really a command. Um, it's not a question. Could you finish the homework? Um, so it's a question and a command, maybe. Um, you know, so these, you know, or I couldn't decide how to catch the crook. Then I decided to spy on the crook with binoculars. Um, to my surprise, I found out he had them too. Then I knew to just follow the crook with binoculars. I don't know, this is a little bit of a play here, but of course it could be the crook that has the binoculars that you're trying to follow, but you also have binoculars that you saw the crook with, so there are a couple of different ways to parse this. The first one there, the crook with the binoculars where the bracket's internal um, to the larger bracketed set is the crook actually has the binoculars, whereas the second one is some event about the crook, that is me watching the crook with binoculars. That's what that second parse is. So there's all this interplay between the, the syntax, how, how it gets rendered as semantics, and then where pragmatic sociology and these other things fill in. Um, so sort of interesting. Also discourse analysis, how propositions fit together in a conversation. This is still uh, along the same theme. Um, the professor told the student to finish the assignment. He was pretty aggravated at how long it was taking to pass in. So um, there's the word it, there's the word he. Um, note that uh, it could be the student that's aggravated. And in fact, the student is the most recently, uh, the most recent antecedent by the time you get to the word he. Um, but you kind of get the idea that it's the professor who was aggravated. So if you ran some very simple, closest antecedent algorithm to find the antecedent, you wouldn't necessarily win. It's really the world knowledge, you know, the professor's getting aggravated, not, not the student. So, you know, and then there's, you know, how long it was taken. That's actually, it, it was taken, that's called pleonastic. That was mentioned in one of the lectures here where it has no... Um, semantic content, like it was raining. No, we can just say rain. <laughs> we don't have to say it was raining, but we do in English. So it was taking to pass it in, that's a different it, uh, that's actually referring to the assignment. So lots of pronominal reference, and also I mentioned a little while ago about cross-document co-reference and um, multiple references to the same entity. So you're reading along in a newspaper article and it mentions, you probably should update the president, but George W. Bush, President of the United States, you know, those are co-referenced, and there could be lots of other ways of influ the influential leader, whatever. Um, and then relations between sentences, John hit the man, he had stolen his bicycle. Once again, pronoun reference, very tough stuff. Um, you know, which which thing does he refer to? Which thing does his <coughs> refer to? Tough um, without reference to the semantics. Yeah, well, I mean, that discourse is actually interwoven with sort of world knowledge, common sense, and then, you know, semantics. So all of that plays together. And here's the one where I'm going to finally answer your question. So, I mean, I don't have an answer, but uh, or I have many answers, one of those. Um, so, you know, this is a very simplified natural language processing pipeline. And we know that things don't generally work this way. Um, the way I've been presenting so far almost assume, seems to assume that things are modularized and these pieces don't talk to each other where we know in fact that if you have syntactic analysis, you can do better morphological analysis. If you can do morphological analysis, you can actually figure out semantic, the semantics behind it. So they're actually very much interwoven, so I have this comment, but of course we all know that strict pipelining 
is often deficient. But this is just an example to show you. And then uh, going back a couple of decades, um, what people worked on in interlingual machine translation was to kind of take that pipeline approach. And then at the bottom, you've got this language that corresponds either to the source or the target language. It's the meaning behind the utterance. So you have some, uh, say, German sentence coming in, morphological analysis takes place, syntactic analysis, semantic interpretation, then you've got a nice interlingual semantic representation. A lot of people, again, have worked on this sort of thing. I, I did some work on this in the late 80s. Um, York did work at around that same time also on this, Jaime Carbonell from CMU. A little later, Kevin Knight looked at this as well. Um, but And then you, what you do is you generate off of that to produce some output, and you, the nice thing about it is the mapping, um, Take you can take N languages and map from any of them into this and out of it, and then you sort of avoid what's called the N squared problem, where you have individual bilingual mappings across all of you have N languages, you've got N squared mappings. Right? So that was supposed to be the nice thing about it. It's very hard to develop an interlingua. A lot of people have talked about this problem for years. You know, how do you come up with the primitive notions in that semantic representation? And people have had many debates for decades about that. Um, I'm going to go back now, I, uh, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, interlingua later, toward the end of this. But I want to go back because... Um, uh, well, first, I'm going to go forward and talk about ambiguity. Then I'm going to come back to machine translation and, and we'll look at what ambiguity is like in a multilingual context. It's even more complicated. Um, but so you could have many different types of ambiguity. And I like this one. So I made her duck. So this is back to our duck example. It's a noun. It's a verb. It's I don't know what else. Um, you know, it could mean I cooked waterfowl for her. It could mean I cooked waterfowl belonging to her. You know, I I made her duck. Um, I created the plaster duck that she owns, so I made it out of something. Um, you know, I forced her to lower her head, so that's the verb sense. Um, I or by magic, I changed her into waterfowl. Um, so it's another, that would be I made her a duck. What? I made her a duck. Well, yeah, duck. exactly. It would be more likely to have a determiner there. I made her. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I made her duck can be in that you can't turn into duck. Uh, voila, I made her duck. You know, I don't know. It, it's it's a stretch, but you're right. It's better. It might be, it might sound better with a determiner. I made her a duck. That That's probably the biggest stretch. But you, but a system that says, hey, in this language, uh and the are optional, because sometimes we don't have to use those. The system's going along and it interprets it, and it doesn't know that, you know, well, actually, it shouldn't have the word uh there if you have that meaning. So these are pretty hard problems. Um, there can also, well, this is just showing you the syntactic disambiguation. So for two of those meanings, you would have a different syntactic structure. And this is where the interplay of syntax and semantics, for example, comes up. Um, that you know, wouldn't even look the same even if you look at the syntax. And that is a key point because in the events, on the events team, we've been talking about semantics, meaning, understanding, and we've taken as a first pass to that hey, can't we distinguish between two meanings simply by looking at the syntax, just as a first pass? And um, there's actually a hypothesis that's been floating around for about two decades that semantics is fully syntactically determined. You don't have the words and the structure that you use for, for no reason at all. You have it because you're trying to convey something. You choose to, to, to put your words in a particular sequence with a certain structure because you're conveying some sort of meaning. I'll get back to that very... Uh, controversial hypothesis actually bore some fruit, believe it or not. So I'll get back to that in the second lecture. Um, so, yeah, so um, again, same things. You, know, you could say duck, or duck is delicious for dinner. Also, things like I went to the bank to deposit my check, I went to the bank to look out at the river. So there are those types of ambiguities, too, where the same word is overloaded with all of these different senses. You know, I went to the bank of windows and chose the one dealing with the last names beginning with. D. Um, so uh, what do we need to help us out? Um, a lot of different resources, um, but uh, and some are listed here. So dictionary, morphology, spelling rules, grammar rules, semantic interpretation rules, discourse interpretation. 
Um, and natural language is going to involve learning or fashioning the rules for each component. So that means maybe automating it or you write them yourself or some combination, um, embedding the rules in some sort of machinery, and then trying to find an efficient way to process the input using that machinery. All right, so some sample language applications are shown here. Um, there's a lot more out there than the ones you see here because um, this slide is, I think, seven years old, so there's a whole lot more out there now. Um, I actually worked with the uh, summarization folks at um, uh, uh, Michigan at, yeah, and Columbia, but basically Drago Mirada. We worked on summarization for a good half decade. Um, now, all those ambiguities I just showed you that I whipped through, when you move into the world of multilingual processing, when you're going from one language to another, those ambiguities are even worse. And so um, some of them may not matter so much, though it's interesting. So I saw the man on the hill with the telescope. Hmm, do we need to disambiguate it? It's kind of ambiguous already. Just pass it through, and the same level of ambiguity will come through the other side when we translate it into Spanish, let's say. I saw the man on the hill with the telescope. Still ambiguous. All right, but then you get into lexical ambiguities, like the English word book, which could mean libro or reservar. Um, of course, luckily, lucky for us, syntax says, well, if you put the word the in front of it, it's not reservar, it's libro. If you uh, say, you know, book, the flight, um, then probably it's the verb form preservar, not the um, noun form libro. But you get the idea that um, these are the sorts of, uh, so book is overloaded in English, right? And so when you're trying to translate, you've got to make a choice. Um, luckily, syntax can help you, but things get worse as you go along. So, um, yeah, up above with libro and reservar, we had two different parts of speech, but now what if you have homography where they're the same part of speech, or ball is actually uh, pelota, which is the thing you throw, a ball, um, or baile, which is uh, you know a place where you go and you dance. Um, so ball could mean either of those two things. Now it starts to get a little more complicated. You can't just use syntax necessarily. You can kind of see the co-occurrence, you know, like throw a ball. Maybe you wouldn't throw the thing where you're going and dancing and putting on your dancing shoes. You wouldn't throw it. Um, so there is a little bit of hint that you can get just from the surrounding context. Um, also for things like kill, where you have uh, polysemy, so um, matar means to kill, as in I killed a human. Acabar means to stop, as in stop a process, but the, you know, you, you say I killed the process, and you better not use the word matar in Spanish, because it's acabar, um, it means stop abruptly. All right, so, and then there's levels of semantic granularity, so esperar is a Spanish verb, um, it translates into a bunch of verbs in English, and it's not a different part of speech, so, and it's very subtle the distinctions between them. So esperar in Spanish means wait, expect, or hope. And we have three different verbs for that in English. Um, the word be in English, we just say be, well, very simple. And, but in Spanish, you better know, is it um, a condition? Is it an illness? You know, I am sick today. Um, is it, you know, a characteristic like I am tall? Um, that's a different form of the word be. So there are very subtle distinctions of part of speech doesn't help you, but the words around that term may help you. So tall versus sick can help you to know. So how, how long do you carry the ambiguity before you try to resolve it? I listen to machine translations. They said you watch the Security Council meeting or something. There are times where the talking goes on, but the translator stops and then rapidly catches up. And sometimes my sense is, well, they just don't know what to say yet. Well, and it's not if until they, they say, get to I'm the gonna point. be, I'm gonna be, when they keep thinking about what are they gonna say next, the interpreter's just gonna go, you're gonna be what? I don't know which verb to use yeah. until you tell me what you're gonna be. You're gonna right. be, you know, um, on time. Are you gonna be sick? Are you gonna, be, you know, what are you? Actually, gonna be is somewhat unambiguous. You can usually tell that that's there, but. Um, but so, yeah, they will wait sometimes. Um, 
but oftentimes they can just go right ahead, you know, with, and, and sure. sometimes the ambiguity carries over into the other language, so yeah. no, nothing lost. There's nothing, there's no imperative to try to resolve the ambiguity right away. If you can, I mean, especially well, in the computing context. I, I would hate the yeah. job of an interpreter because they really so Yeah, simultaneous off. interpretation is Yeah, hard. it's really hard, but they do it. But in the case well. of translating a document or something, then it, you could carry it forward as long as you want. Yeah. And then make some decision having seen what evidence comes downstream. You can. If it's a stream, it depends on whether it's streaming data coming in, you know, when you get one bite of the apple versus, which an interpreter, that's how they operate, versus, you know, you've got the whole document. So let me do named entity recognition and co-reference across the Well, it the depends on when you want the answer to. Right. If it's streaming and you want an answer, an anytime answer, yeah. which means right away, then you have you only have a finite window. Which this is true. Decision. And it's a question of, you know, how many mistakes you're going to make. Streaming is starting to be huge. There are all these evaluations now where it's, it's like we've entered into this new world. Like now we have to do streaming one bite of the apple and you're done. You don't get to revisit it. There's no, everything's monotonically moving forward. And it's, yeah, it's really hard, really For hard. What kind of an application would you find? Um, so let's say you have lots of terabytes of data coming through every day through your shop, wherever your shop may be. Maybe you have a three letter name that we won't mention. And um, you've got all this stuff coming through and you just don't have time. Tomorrow more stuff's gonna come through. Mm -hmm. You just don't have, this is the big data problem, right? But this still, is, everything isn't some, it's not word by word, it's quantized. You don't have this time. Is, this you is a document, this is a conversation. The terabyte, you, you kind of have to do it one thing that, I mean, you could, you could try to do it. There could be some way, you know, there are smart ways, I mean, the method is of storing data so that you can access it efficiently. And then maybe you can, maybe you can do that. Um, but there are these um, applications where they're just flooding it's just too the fast. pipe. Yeah, they're just flooding you daily, secondly. I don't, I don't even know how to say it. It's just so much data coming flying through. So it's really hard. Um, and the, and the other thing is, at certain sites, they're not allowed to keep the data for more than n time units. So one bite of the apple is all you got. And the next thing's already coming through, and they're already trashing, you know, like you're not allowed to. Yeah. So it's very, very hard stuff. Yeah. Sounds like so, a unique problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's coming up. Yeah. I mean, it's maybe more of an Intel, but, you know, DOD also, usually DOD slash Intel. Um, all right, so last example is just fish. Um, if it's fish that you're going to eat, you better say pescado because if you say pez, everybody will laugh at you because that's like a goldfish. You're not going to, like, you know, in your jar, your pet, you're not going to eat your pet. So, um, yeah, things like that, world knowledge. All right, so um, moving to sort of um, moving along here, uh, when you're trying to translate, you have these distinctions across language, and some of them I've just mentioned to you. Um, but it turns out, you know, they, there can be two translationally equivalent phrases, one in one language, one in the other, and they're just distributed in different ways. The syntax, the rules of that language, the lexicon, you know, the, the lexicon give you different things. So, um, in, and I'm giving kind of English glosses for things now. I'm not giving you the Spanish yet. Um, but so English run into the room and Spanish, you wouldn't really talk about running into a room. You'd say enter in the room running. So the, it's the motion followed by the manner. That's how things are broken up in Spanish. And so I worked on this problem of the divergence problem and, and spent a good deal of time trying to characterize divergences. Um, and I got it down to like seven categories. Um, I'll show you those in a minute. And so one of them is, is this sort of thing where you have what's called conflational divergence, where you know, we actually can bundle the motion and the manner together into the single word run, um, whereas in a language like Spanish, those you, you can't really do that. I, because of that, you know, there's all this bundling we do. So we're allowed to say, I faxed you the letter. Um, you know, that is, I sent by fax. Now, in Spanish, you, you know, if there's sort of, if they're in an English-speaking country, like now I've heard people say vacuum, um, but they would prefer to say pass the aspirator, which is 
vacuum. Um, so we take nouns and we bundle them into verbs. Um, we take manner and we bundle them into verbs, whereas Spanish, that tends to be pulled out, which if you look at Spanish speech, it is many more syllables per, per minute than English speak, and it's a good thing because they need all that room to have it un, unpacked like this. So it, it's actually true. Um, these are some of the divergences that we studied. Um, I, my, early on, a long time ago, I, I kind of came up with these categories, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And then we began to really study it when we had the tools to look at this broad scale, like how often do these types of divergences arise? So, um, so English, we looked at English versus Spanish and English versus Arabic. And um, a divergence is always with respect to two, language, two languages. Right? So you can have it across any set of pairs. But we tended to have English in everything we did. Uh, typically, we were taking Spanish and translating to English or Arabic or Korean or Chinese into English. Yeah, we definitely need to change that. Um, what was it even on? So, um, mouse pointer. Oh, mouse pointer. So this first example, be jealous. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But it gives you an idea that um, it, in Spanish, in English, we can say this be adjectival form. In Spanish, it's sort of a possessive, you're possessing the jealousy. You have uh, jealousy. Um, I mentioned conflational already, that in English, we can say float. No, in Spanish, you have to say go in a floating manner. There has to be the motion and the manner, and they're split apart. <coughs> um, structural, um, there are things like enter the house which we would say that in English because into is incorporated in the verb enter. It's already in there. We don't have to say it again, but in Spanish you would actually say it in la casa. You have the word in. Um, head swapping is something that came up in our event group recently. Ian, you may remember this. Because um, we were talking about, well, you know, you're running into the room, but you want to change it to enter running. That is, you want to swap and have the head be something that was subordinate before. Um, so the, this kind of swapping happens. Um, also thematic, you know, I have a headache. Instead, you would say, my head hurts me. Um, so you swapped. You know, the head is kind of the subject of, of whereas in English, I am the subject. So those sorts of um, divergences arise a lot. And what we wanted to do was find out if there was an efficient way of mapping between two languages in the face of these divergence cases. And I'm going to show you, when I say a lot, I'm going to give you some numbers on the last slide that they come up a real lot. Um, and so um, what we wanted to do was uh, we don't want to build a whole bunch of resources for our language, for each language that we add to our systems. And so what we wanted to do was to tap into the richness of the language we're translating into, which is English, for this particular um, set of projects we were working on. Um, English was the target language. And we have a lot of resources for English. So can we leverage that to do cross-language work? Um, and in doing this, we want to use some but not all components of interlingua. So we call it an approximate interlingua that is we don't want to go all the way down into this deep representation, like in that pipeline diagram I showed you where interlingual representation is at the bottom. It's very expensive to do that sort of thing. And you don't always like, you get into arguments about what a primitive should be. So can we just use sort of the structures that are provided to us in English, but mapping them to another language? And what does that mean? Um, and then when we generate our answer, that is when we translate from, say, Chinese into English, we generate a bunch of possibilities and we apply statistical extraction to pare it down. Like, throw a ball? That can't possibly mean the type of ball that you dance at. Let's get rid of baile and keep pelota. Of course, I'm doing this backwards because we're typically generating English. But... Um, but you get the idea that if you look at the statistical co-occurrence, you can often figure the, out which one's the right one. All right, so let me go through this quickly and show you um, interlingual versus approximate interlingual. All right, so in standard interlingual approaches from, say, 20 years ago, people were arguing about primitives and relations, um, building bi-directional lexicons, um, you always analyze into an interlingua IL, you generated out of the interlingua. 
In the approximate interlingual approach, the idea was to have a hybrid symbolic statistical design to over-generate a bunch of answers and then use statistical ranking to pair out the ones that didn't, um, didn't really pan out. And what we decided as our starting point for this was to use a dependency representation. So now people who worked on the event project, you know what a dependency representation looks like. And we use structural expansion for deeper uh, overgeneration. So here's what it looks like. You have something like Maria le dio patadas a Juan. I can't say John in Spanish. It sounds so strange. Uh, which means Mary kicked John. I also have in my thesis somewhere, Mary stabbed John. And Mary, you know, it doesn't matter. You can stab, kick, do all these things. You don't have a verb like kick and stab, right? You have to say, I did something with an instrument. Um, so this is about, you know, giving some sort of um, footwork toward John. That's the original uh, Spanish sentence. And then it comes out, Mary kicked John. Well, how, how can we do this in, a, in, a, in as efficient representation as possible um, but still keeping some meaning components. Well, um, it it requires a parser on the Spanish side, so we can parse into a dependency representation, which actually dependency tree um, parsers are available for many languages. So we were able to get one for Spanish easily, and we produced um, give Mary kick John, and what we did was we superimposed some conceptual representations on this. So. Um, I haven't defined that yet. Um, I think that's going to have to wait until the next lecture. But there's something called lexical conceptual structure that has things like cause and motion, like the word go, um, state, state of uh, events like be, um, all of that. And we have a big lexicon where we associate these conceptual representations with the dependency tree. And then in addition, we have what are called thematic roles, agent, theme, and goal. The agent of the kicking is Mary. Um, what sort of thing, uh, who received this action? That's John, that's the goal. And then the theme is the kick. That's the thing that's moving, all right? So sort of, it's more like the footwork is moving toward John. Um, now, how do you map that into English? Well, we have this thing. This is really the motivation for categorical variations. Um, we have this thing called cat bar that if in the English we can find. Oops. Oh, thank you. It's so hard for me to do that though. All right, if we can find. Somebody needs to make one of these things that you attach to your finger. Yeah. Which is Bluetooth synced with the mouse. I know. Yeah. Well, Last summer. Smart boards have been around, but they never caught on. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to just hook up a second camera that we can switch back. So um, this kit here. That's I'm highlighting is is in or I'm mousing around is a noun form in Spanish and um, we are allowed to promote what's called promotion that to a to the um, top event that's happening on the, on the other side as long as there's some conflation link between these and the way you get that conflation link is from a resource that we built called Catvar. Okay, so you can give a kick. Um, you can also kick, as in I kicked someone. Um, both of those forms are in the cat bar database, which is based primarily on English. And that's what allows this conflation to come out. As long as you cover the red, you know, these, these uh, thematic roles that are in red here. Um, and that's how we did that. All right. So, um, let me see how many more. I think people have to go. So, I think I'll pick up here next time. Um, I did want to put up one last slide, which is how often do those kind of divergences arise? So the one I just showed you was a conflational divergence, the giving a kick or giving a stab or whatever. Um, you also have categorical, like I have hunger versus I am hungry. They actually arise very frequently, right? So um, we looked at a, U, the UN Spanish English corpus, and we found that 32% of the sentences in there have some form of divergence falling under one of these five categories. Oh, does that mean 68% uh, are exactly the same syntactic form? Does it mean what? So the sentences that, uh, that do not diverge, are they uh, one or a word? word uh, well, like, are you talking about down below the divergence types? Which 
Because I'm going to tell you about that in a second. Uh, I mean, the 68 percent that are not uh, the body. Or are they yeah, word to word? They right? are. They could be exhibiting divergences that we didn't study because we only had seven of these. But we thought um, we were getting actually a lot of bang for our buck with these seven um, that we came up with. Um, so yeah, the 68 don't have any that fall into the categories that we mentioned, which are here: categorical conflation. But they could have uh, other other issues. Yeah. Other, you know, ways of expressing the determiner or something like that. That's not. That's I, mean, not I, I thought it would be the other way around. That seventy percent would be the What? Wait, say it again. No. It, it, it's a very low number. If if we, if these are all the sentences that uh, differ. Yeah. I, I would so you think, one, you think one third is is not a big deal? You're saying it's a small number. Is, is that no, what you're yeah, saying? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought it would be more. You thought it would be more, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we also did this for Chinese and English, and we saw more of this. Um, Spanish and English are closer together, and actually one-third shocked me. I, I was so surprised that one out of every three sentences you were going to come up with categorical conflational structure, you know, some, some divergence that needed to be addressed. So, And then when we looked into the divergence types, and actually these numbers, I forgot, uh, actually, I forgot why these overlap. I think I think there were overlapping. So yeah, this is what it was. So it turns out categorical divergence gives you the best, um, the most bang for the buck because if you have categorical divergence, you most likely have one of the other divergences. Categorical divergence shows up almost always with conflational, structural, or head swapping, not necessarily with thematic. Um, and so as a result, these numbers don't add up to anything like 100%, all right? They're much more because there's so much overlap. So that was another interesting finding that we had. So if, um, if somebody is giving a conflational sentence, they're saying, I gave a kick, turns out there's a categorical divergence there, all right? So because the kick, um, the give and kick could be conflated into just a single word like kick. All right, so that so there are, there are two different things going on there. So that I think I'll end there, and then we'll pick up next time. There's fewer slides next time, but they're much more dense. So um, yeah, probably need an hour and ten minutes, but we'll see. So thanks everybody. Any questions? I just I have one question. You talked about how you want to get to the, the document level. Like, how compositional is this? If you really understand each of the sentences, then will you understand the document? Or can you understand the document by understanding each of the sentences? Like, do, does it decompose that way? Or to do document processing, are you going to come at it with a new approach? Or, or would that be valuable? Yeah, I mean, I think for the most common one that comes to mind is summarization. Right? That's the most practical. I mean, if you have a bunch of documents, you want to know what they're about, particularly if you know they're on some topic, um, you can do cross-document summarization. And there, you don't typically take it as a holistic thing. You look for the most salient point in each of the documents. And some of the documents either are redundant with what you already know from others, or they just don't have the key information in them. So, so I think it's kind of I'm not sure how composition, you know, when you do it document wide like that, it's not as compositional as within a sentence where you've got, you know. Well, right, like so co resolution couldn't happen on just the sentence level. So, but yeah. I guess would you want to change how you parse syn syntactically at the sentence level if you know you're going to be doing document level analysis on it? That's a good question. Possibly. I, I have to think about that. That's a good um, in terms of uh, this machine translation, you mentioned two approaches, interlingua and the other one was statistica. Uh, approximate interlingua, where we don't go into super deep representation, but we have more of a dependency tree with some conceptual information. So both of these are not statistical approaches. They're both... Uh, like well, statistical extraction happens at the end. So after we generate off of that, we'll get 
gave kicks to Mary, gave kicks to John, kicked John. You get a whole bunch of sentences, and then with corpus analysis, you can say, oh, kicked John is much more common than gave kicks to John. So it would pick, kick, you know, kicked John. So how does this compare to those uh, approaches that are that use parallel uh, corpora? And you need parallel. You, you need, need parallel, parallel to do the statistical extraction. Right. So how does it compare to? Uh, I mean, maybe like qualitatively, which one results in a better translation? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. I didn't get to say it in this, but um, when you bring the two together, the linguistically motivated, you know, this sort of thing, with the statistical, you get better than either of the two alone. You can't just do it with knowledge-based processing. That won't get you what you need. But you'd have too many opportunities, too many things to pick from, and you wouldn't know which one was right, so you need the statistics to pare that down. But the statistics doesn't necessarily know the relationship between giving a kick and kicking. And so that's why the linguistic structure helps you with that piece of it. So, yeah. Thanks all. Do you have any questions up there in the peanut gallery? There, there are some feedbacks so I muted people, so unmute yourself if you have a question. There was that scratching sound. So. I know, but Brent, I should just spoke. All right, uh, uh, Brent, Brent, you're, you're okay. Uh, you're not muted Brent, anymore. Brent, did you have a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh uh, no, no, we were just saying thank you. Okay. Sure. Oh, uh, we had to pick one. We had to pick a meeting time. Is this time okay for everybody? Thursdays won't be okay. Oh yeah, they won't be. Okay. So we had to pick Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. What? Are you guys available, like, say, next Wednesday? Uh, that should work for me. Yes, yes. That's, that's